Okay, good morning, everybody. You might be wondering, why are there dates and, and scriptures written up on the board? It's because I failed you. I had full intentions to make bookmarks this week, and then here came Sunday, and I have no bookmarks. I am sorry. I will try really hard to make them this week. Uh, but here is uh, the rest of Deuteronomy from today until, until the end of Deuteronomy, so you can take a photo of that. You write that down. Or if you have the app on your phone, you'll never have to depend on me again, which is much more trustworthy. So uh, there's a few options for you. I am sorry. I'll do better next time. I hope. Uh, let, me, let me pray for us, and then let's begin our morning. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the last few months that we've had together, that, that now we're arriving in the last book of the Torah. And, and God, you have you have given us eyes to see and ears to hear many things that we have not seen and have not heard before. Um, but God, you've also reminded us of, of your faithfulness, of your goodness, of your graciousness, uh, of many things that we have learned already. And God, even as we, we see in our reading in Deuteronomy so far, uh, you, you often call us to remember because we are forgetful people. So God, we ask that we would, uh, we would be reminded and that we would remember who you are and what you have accomplished on our behalf for, for our good and for your glory. So God, we love you and we need you to pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Who has a tree already? A tree, a Christmas tree. Uh, yeah. You, who, who intends to get one in the next week? Who intends to not get one? Anyone? <laughs> nice. I was almost there of like, we're not going to get a Christmas tree, but figured Noah, Noah would see. What scripture? <laughs> yeah. the, the one about Jesus being hung on it? That's a cross. Uh, I, the only scripture that's coming to mind is in Jeremiah, and it's uh, against doing those things. So, you know... <laughs> Do I want to be an idolater this Christmas? I'm just kidding. Have you guys seen? Have you seen? I'm kidding. There is, oh, there's always, uh, if this is you, I have no idea. But there's always this meme that circulates around Christmas time. Or I guess it's not a meme. It's totally serious. About Christmas trees. And it has this passage from Jeremiah about cutting trees down and then decorating them with, like, gold and ornaments and stuff. And it's about, and... And the whole point is like, how, how dare we do idolatrous practice? But the whole point of that is cutting down a tree and then turning it into an idol yeah. statue. Yeah. And it's just like, it's so fun. It's not about a Christmas tree. It's about an idol statue. But <laughs> Facebook warriors love it. If that's you, I'm sorry. I know none of you on Facebook very well. So I, I hardly get on. Just don't share it this year. You're missing the point. Okay. Uh, how has reading gone in the last week? We finished Numbers, and we've started Deuteronomy. Thumbs up, done all the reading, thumbs down, none of it, somewhere in between. Okay, a lot, a lot of thumbs up. What about comprehension? Feel like comprehending more and more, or like, I'm still just not getting this at all, and then somewhere in between. Okay, cool. Uh, so we finished Numbers. Any, any thoughts, reflections, comments on the end, end of Numbers? Last week, we talked up through... We, we've kind of talked about 25, so that's about 10 chapters that we didn't talk about. Yeah, John? No, the uh, tribes of Gad and Reuben. Okay. Yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, like, you know, there's all this information. Mm hmm. Yeah, so John's question is about Numbers 34, I think. Or maybe it's 33. You know, I don't remember off the top of my head. It's in there. Maybe it's Numbers 31. No, it's not. 32? Yeah, Numbers 32. So Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh, they're, they're going through uh, the the east side of the Jordan River, and they're like, you know, this, this land's pretty nice. How about we just take this as our inheritance? And at first, Moses gets really angry at them because remember what the first rebel big rebellion was in the wilderness. It was the people rejecting the land. When uh, they're in the land, they send the spies, and they're like, we don't want this land. We're going to appoint a leader to take us back to Egypt. 
And the whole thing was that they were rejecting the promised land given to them by God. So then here is a chapter where the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh, they're on the east side of the Jordan River, a.k.a. not the promised land. And they say, how about we take this land? This will be really nice. And at first, Moses gets really, really angry at them because they're rejecting the land, i.e. they're rejecting the promises of God. But then they negotiate. They talk through it a little bit. And they say, no, no, no we're, not, we're not rejecting the promise. In fact, we, we'll establish like, our, our wives and our children here and our livestock, but we're going to go into battle with you guys, i.e. the next book, Joshua, that we're going to begin to read. We're going to go into the land. We're going to fight with you guys. We're going to make sure that the land is conquered. Then we'll come back and we'll live here. So then Moses decides, whoa, okay. It's kind of ambiguous. What do you guys think? Is this, is this a good thing or a bad thing? That's taking place with Reuben Gad and half of Manasseh with them settling outside of the land of Canaan. You think it's bad? Anyone think it's good? It's probably good for them because they weren't even in the cross anyway. Yeah, maybe. But they do go over in the book of Joshua and they fight. Why wouldn't they have? Because it's, uh, it's the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh. So not not the people. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what do you think, Mike? Yeah. What about this verse in Deuteronomy? We haven't read this yet, but in Deuteronomy uh, 12, oh my goodness. Uh, Deuteronomy 12, 20. When the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he has promised you, and you say, I will eat meat because you crave meat, and you eat meat whenever you desire. When the Lord enlarges your territory as he promised you, I mean, that's interesting, right? It is the promise for the land, is it just about that, that small geographical location previously known as the land of Canaan? Well, apparently the promise does include more than just that. It's about an enlarged territory. And the way Paul understands it in uh, Romans 4, I believe, is that it, Abraham was promised to inherit the world, the entire world. Now, this is, in this context in Deuteronomy, this is what, it, what look, it looks like if Israel walks in faithfulness to Yahweh. They'll be able to lend, um, they'll lend financially to other nations, but they won't have to um, borrow from other nations. Their territory will be enlarged and they'll be a blessing to all the nations. They will fulfill the Abrahamic covenant if they walk faithfully to Yahweh. But there is this idea that the territory will be in, enlarged. Now, there's also later books like, um, like Kings, uh, First and Second Kings, where it seems like uh, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, they're, they're like the, one of the first ones to go in Assyrian exile. Uh, so, you know, how does God's judgment come in the book of Kings? It seems like it comes first on them. But then there is Moses, the leader, where, I mean, at least his, his thinking of it is that this isn't a bad thing. But it's ambiguous. It's really ambiguous. I think we're left scratching our heads as we read on the rest of the story of like, I wonder how this is going to turn out. Yeah. wonder how it's going to turn out. And I think by and large, we get to the end of our Old Testament readings and we're like, it didn't turn out great. It didn't turn out great. But do we remember any other stories about um, quote unquote brothers choosing different lands from each other? Not land. Abraham and Lot. Yeah. In Genesis 13, there's this story here where they had just gone down into Egypt. They come back and they're, they're exceedingly wealthy. They have like so much money. Uh, and Lot, who went with Abraham, also had flocks and herds, verse 6, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together, and there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock at the time that the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. 
Then Abraham said to Lot, let, let there no, be no strife between you and me, between your herdsmen, my herdsmen, because we are brothers. The Hebrew word brother right here, translated as kinsmen. We're brothers. Why are we fighting? Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left, I'll go to the right. If you take the right, I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and he saw the Jordan Valley. It was well watered like the garden of Yahweh, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. And Lot chose that place. He said, how about I take this land? Now there's Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh saying, look at how great this land is. We'll take this for our flocks. Because we have a lot of flocks. Ambiguous. But when we begin to, to read these stories in connection, I think we see it in a little bit more of a negative light. And that's definitely how Moses saw it at first. But he concedes and says, okay, if you go to battle with us, you can have it. And they do go to battle with the rest of the people. Other questions on numbers? Or reflections, thoughts in general. Is there any conversation about whether or not they're taking land that belongs to someone else? I mean, I guess we've heard that a couple of different times. What do you mean? Say more. They are dispossessing people of their land. It's not like untouched land. They're dispossessing people. Okay. Yeah, they're going to dispossess people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Yeah, Daniel. Mm hmm. Is Israel's God's judgment for Canaan? Yes. We read that in Deuteronomy 9. We'll look at that today. Yeah. Because Moses intercedes for him. And, and Moses recounts that in Deuteronomy about how he, he interceded for Moses and God relents. But... He doesn't go into the land. Yeah. Faces that one along with Moses. And that's because of both the rebellion of the people rejecting the land in Numbers 13, 14, and then also the striking of the rock in Numbers 20. Moses is a part of that. So that's also why he doesn't go into the land. Um, but yeah, he is um, he's spared from the wrath of God because someone intercedes on his behalf. Good question. What, the question was, how come only Miriam got leprosy when Miriam and Aaron uh, argue against Moses in Numbers chapter 12? Good question. I also wondered that, and I didn't think hard enough to find an answer. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the beginning, the Numbers 12, though, and then uh, Numbers 20 are like bookends of the travelings. And one, the the curse of the rebellion comes on Miriam. On the last one, the curse comes on Aaron. But both in Numbers uh, 20 or 21, both of them die. So it's kind of like bookends of Moses' own family going against him. John, are you going to say something? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, he wouldn't be able to serve. He would, he would just die right away. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. I like that. There we go. Yeah. Good thoughts, people. Yeah. 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 I accept. <laughs> All right. Let's uh let's dive into Deuteronomy. The the names of the books of our Bible they, they come from Greek translations of these books. Uh, but if you ever wondered the Hebrew names of the first five books of the Bible, it's just the first few words or the first word of the book. So uh, right here, these are the words, first 
opening line is two Hebrew words. And that's, that's, the, oh, that's the name of Deuteronomy. It actually, it sounds way cooler than calling it Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is Greek for second law or sec- because it seems like this is the second giving of the law or repeat of the law. So our, our names like uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those were the, the Greek names for these books. And they have logical reasons for that. Like Numbers is called Numbers because it begins and ends with a big census with lots of numbers. But the Hebrew name for it is, is In the Wilderness. A little bit more fun. Uh, Leviticus is called Leviticus because it seems like it has a lot of regulations for the Levitical priesthood, even though it's actually primarily for the layperson, the book of Leviticus. And the, the Hebrew name for the book of Leviticus is uh, He Calls Out. The opening words, He Calls. Yeah. Vayakra. It's cool. Genesis, uh, um, the word Genesis means like origin. The In the beginning is how Genesis begins. That's the original name of, of Genesis. So they have a little bit funner names, I think, in, in Hebrew. So if we just think that we're about to read, these are the words. Specifically, the words that Moses spoke to all the people of Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness. So if you remember our, our drawing of the macro structure of the Torah, Genesis and Deuteronomy are the bookends of the Torah, and all of Deuteronomy takes place in one location. It's unique in that way. Um, Exodus, half of it, the second half, all takes place at Mount Sinai. The book of Numbers, the first half, takes place all at Mount Sinai, but Exodus and Numbers also have stories about them wandering through the wilderness and camping in different locations. The book of Leviticus also all takes place in one location. It's, It's it's divine speeches from God at the tent of meeting. So those all take place in one location at Mount Sinai. And then Genesis, as we remember, it's just a lot of, of wandering and stories and sojourning with Abraham being called out of Babylon. And then eventually his descendants descend down into Egypt. But the book ends with uh, Jacob, who's renamed Israel, blessing his 12 sons. That's in Genesis chapter 49. That's one of the important chapters in your Bible. Genesis 49, he begins by saying, let me tell you what will take place in the end of days. And that phrase is going to occur a few times in Deuteronomy, towards the beginning and towards the end. And Deuteronomy is all uh, this speech, these speeches given from Moses to the 12 tribes. And the book's going to conclude with Moses speaking blessings over the 12 tribes, and especially telling what's going to happen in the end days, in the last days. Um, The book of Deuteronomy itself has a three-division structure, where the first portion, chapters 1 through chapters 11, is kind of like the prelude to the law commands, where Moses is going to recount the wanderings in the wilderness. He's going to remind them what was accomplished uh, by God at Mount Sinai. He's going to remind them of the core covenant stipulations, which are the Ten Commandments. And and then he's going to to remind them why God has invited them into this relationship. Chapter 12 through the middle of 26, it's going to be all law commands. So the, the whole Deuteronomy part, like the second law portion, is chapter 12 through halfway through chapter 26. There's where we're going to be getting repeat laws and also some new laws. And also some variant laws, laws that occur a little bit differently than they did in Exodus or Leviticus or in Numbers. The final portion of the book, halfway through 26 to the end, uh, 34, is going to be like Moses' final words, where he, it, it, he lays out the blessing for obedience, the curse for disobedience. And then he says, and here's what I'm really confident is going to happen, which is not very positive. In fact, let's just look at it right now. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy 30 takes place right after uh, a few chapters of blessings. Here's what will happen if you walk faithfully. Here's all the blessings. And a few chapters of curses. Here's what will happen if you do not walk faithfully to Yahweh. So he just got done talking about the curses. And now in Deuteronomy 30, he says, and when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse, and otherwise, uh, in other words, you are not going to be faithful. The blessings and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among the nations where the Lord your God has driven you. It's like the, that's the ultimate 
part of the curse is to be exiled from the land, to be driven out from the land among the nations. So they've experienced the utmost part of the curse. And when that time happens and you and you begin to remember this, verse 2, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice and all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I command you today. So we'll pause there because there's a tension in this passage and it's going to actually be introduced at the beginning of Deuteronomy, specifically Deuteronomy chapter 10, with this idea of circumcision of the heart. The, The first thing that we hear is, you know, when you are in exile, if at any point, if you return, if you turn back to, to God and you obey his voice, this is verse two, obey his voice with all of your heart and with all of your soul, then Yahweh, he will bring you back. He will turn you back. He'll return your fortunes and he'll gather you back. But then as we're reading down in verse six, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul that you may live. So there's this tension of, well, hold on. Am I going to be able to turn to Yahweh and to obey his voice? Or is God going to do something to my heart that enables me to do that? Which one brings me back? That's a tension. It, it sits right here. I'm not trying to answer it right now. I just want to put that before us. We're going to go back to the beginning of Deuteronomy. We'll ponder that as we read this book and a lot more books to come. Who's doing this returning? Do I respond and then God brings me back? Or does God do something so that I can respond so that he brings me back? Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 1 and explore the book a little bit. The whole book of Deuteronomy is structured as a collection of Moses' speeches. There are a few times where Moses' speech starts, and there are little conclusions. And he starts, and he concludes. But they're all taking place. They're presented as him giving this one speech in one day to the people of Israel. Now, who is he giving this speech to? Yes, the children. The children of the Exodus generation. It's the wilderness generation. Everyone who came out of Exodus apart from Moses at this point, has died. They do not exist anymore. The ones who led the rebellion with the golden calf, like none of them are are around anymore. It is now uh, the second generation, the children, which are the wilderness generation, who grew up for 40 years in the wilderness. That's who he is speaking to. They're about to enter the land. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness, in the Arabah opposite of Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban and Hazaroth and Dizahab. It is an 11-day journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. In other words, to get from Mount Sinai to where they are now takes 11 days to walk. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all the Lord had given him in commandment to them. 11 days, 40 years. What's that highlighting? Had they obeyed? Yep. Had they listened? The, the word that gets translated as obey, as hear, and as listen are all the same Hebrew words. It's, it's one word. It's the Hebrew word shema. It's going to show off off the charts in the book of Deuteronomy. That word and the word love occur all the time. So if you read the word obey, just think, listen, or maybe write that in your book. Listen, 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 or hear, hear, hear. 
So it should have only taken 11 days, but because of their unfaithfulness and their rebellion, it took them 40 years to make this journey. So it's highlighting up front uh, the, the downfall of not listening to God about how something could be so simple, but then you take it matters into your own hands and it becomes so tragic and so long. So it should have taken a really short time, but instead it took a really long time. They went through the wilderness and there was a few fights. Remember that fight with Sihon and the fight with Og? And now beyond the Jordan, this is verse five, beyond the Jordan in the land of Moab, so other side of the promised land looking in, Moses undertook to explain this law. So he, that's what Deuteronomy is. It's Moses explaining the law. And this, uh, this word, it means to, um, it, the two other times it's used is in Deuteronomy 27.8 and Habakkuk 2.2. 2, and it means to like write clearly into stone. So it's being used as a metaphor. So it, to write legibly. You ever have someone in your life who has horrible handwriting and you can't decipher it to make, <laughs> Daniel's like, that's actually me. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Daniel. But we have people in our life who are like, can you please write legibly so that I can understand what you wrote? So as a metaphor, you could, you could speak legibly and you could explain something in a clear manner so that someone can understand. That is what the book of Deuteronomy is. It's Moses undertaking to explain, to make clear the Torah for this next generation who are now going into the land. He's making it clear and plain for them. Saying, the Lord our God said to us in Horeb, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all their neighbors in the Arabah. Arabah means like desert or wilderness, like dry place. In the Arabah, in the hill countries and in the lowlands and in the Negev and by the seacoast, the land of the Canaanites and Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the, the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them and to their offspring after them. Just for the record, the, uh, the land that was just detailed right there is way bigger than the land of Canaan. The river Euphrates to the, the coastline, uh, which is where, uh, let's see, the, by the sea coast here in verse 7. The seacoast? Well, that's where the Philistines live, like the entire time in the book of Judges and then into the, the kingdom period. But that's supposed to be Israel's land. Pretty big. Um, so Moses begins to um, recount not only God's faithfulness, but how they've arrived at this point. And the way he tells the story, there are, are some different details given, some different perspectives added, some details left out, some details included. But some things that I just want to Highlight, at that time, I said to you, I am not able to bear you myself. The Lord your God has multiplied you. Where, do we re where did we first hear that phrase, multiply? Genesis chapter one. Yeah, be fruitful and multiply. This is the blessing of Genesis one. And what Moses is saying is Israel has multiplied because God has been faithfully blessing them. God has multiplied you, and behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. Where did we hear that phrase? Genesis. Also in Genesis, but not Genesis 1. Mm, I don't actually know off the top of my head. Genesis 15. Uh, what is Genesis 15 about? The Abrahamic covenant. If I wanted to read about the Abrahamic covenant, I would turn to Genesis chapter 15 and 17. Yes, 12, 15, and 17. So this is a line about the Abrahamic covenant. So for Moses to begin by saying, God has multiplied you, and today you are more numerous than the stars of heaven. What is he saying by saying that? Yeah, God has been faithful. The, the covenants are being fulfilled right now in our presence. Here we are. This is God's covenant faithfulness to you. It's not just God being kind. It's God's covenant faithfulness. Now he says, may, may the Lord, the God of your fathers, make you thousand times as many as you are and bless you as he has promised you. How can I bear by myself the weight and the burden of you and your strife? Choose for your tribes wise and understanding and experienced men. 
wise and understanding. Have we heard of anyone in our Bible so far who was wise and understanding? With this description, Daniel? He's, they are wise. What about wise and understanding? We could read a little bit more, but just think wise and understanding. Joseph. Joseph was described by Pharaoh as being wise and understanding. Uh, In Genesis 41, verse 39, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning, that's understanding, and wise as you are. So Joseph had, what what were the qualities that Joseph possessed that made him appear to Pharaoh as wise and understanding? Yeah, he had those dreams. What would we what word would we use to categorize those dreams? Uh, I heard prophecy, I heard visions, uh, more revelation. God is revealing something to them. By God's revelation through prophecies, through through dreams specifically with Joseph, by him receiving revelation, the king of another nation says, there is no one so wise and understanding, so wise and discerning as this man because he had the revelation of God. Keep that in mind. We're going to keep reading. So Moses' advice is to choose for your tribes, uh, wise and understanding and experienced men. This this is the word uh, for knowledge, so knowledgeable men. Um, Knowledge or to know something, this Hebrew word both communicates um, just like head knowledge, but then also the experiential knowledge of that thing. So Choose for yourself knowledgeable men, and I will appoint them as your heads. It'd be like if you were doing a remodel in your house, like you're going to redo the kitchen, and you've never done a kitchen before, but you know someone who's a contractor. Like, they're experienced. They're knowledgeable. They have experience doing that. They're actually going to be pretty pretty good at it. You should appoint that person to redo your kitchen rather than you doing it yourself. That's a bad idea. So they're being appointed as heads. Now, this, this uh, appointment of leaders There are two stories in the Torah, one in Exodus, one in Numbers, where we have this unfolding, except for here it's the word head being used about them. Do you guys remember what the other words are? Uh, In verse verse, uh, 13, I will appoint them as your heads. They're judges. They're called judges, I believe, in Exodus 18. And then in the book of Numbers... The parallel story, they're called elders. Judges, elders, heads. And these three stories, Moses is now recounting those stories of Exodus 18 and Numbers chapter 11. And these people that you're appointing over your your tribes and over your, your groups, he calls them heads. So like the top or an authority or one who leads. Um, Joshua, when he goes in ahead of everybody else, he's called the head. He's the front of the line leading the charge. So they're appointed as heads, but the other terms for them are judges and elders. All right, let's keep reading. Let that sit there. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and experienced men, wise and knowledgeable men, and set them as heads over you, commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, commanders of fifties, commanders of tens, and officers throughout your tribes. And I charge your judges, there it is, at that time, hear the cases between your brothers and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the alien who is with, with him. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone, for the judgment is God's. In the case that is too hard for you, you shall bring to me and I will hear it. And I commanded you at the time all the things that you should do. This is a, a side note, but there in um, in church government, there there's many ways to organize the governance of the church because there's just not like there's not a pamphlet in the New Testament or the Old Testament that like walks you through. Here's how to organize the governmental structure of the local church. But there are a lot of pieces that we can put together from it. There are some churches who do what's called the Moses model. And what they mean by that is, you know what, Moses, he was the guy and he really led the charge. And their whole idea is like, we have one guy who does everything. But I'm just like, it's like you haven't even read 
Deuteronomy chapter 1 or Exodus chapter 18 or Numbers chapter 11 because Moses did not call all the shots. He had elders. He had judges who did it with him, along with him, and helped bear the burden of the people. So I'm just like, how can you have one guy appointed? We should always have a plurality if we have if we have the, the gift from, from God to have a plurality of elders, we should have a plurality of elders. So I'm really thankful for UFC having a plurality and not a single dude. Okay. I think that's a Hebrew expression. Yeah. Okay, let's keep reading. <laughs> then we sent out from Horeb. We went through all that great and terrifying wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, as the Lord God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea, and I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has set set the land before you. Go up and take possession as the Lord your God of your fathers has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Anyone? This is like this is classic coffee cup uh, from Hobby Lobby type of thing. Daniel, you had your hand up? Yeah, this is what God says to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, Joshua 1, 9, when Joshua is about to go in to the land and lead the people as their head. But right now, Moses is just saying that to everyone. And at the end of the, the book of Deuteronomy, Uh, Moses, again, is going to say that multiple times, both to Israel and to Joshua. But the the verse we usually remember is just Joshua chapter 1, where it's said just to Joshua personally about his personal struggles in life that he's going through. But the context of do not fear and be not dismayed is about going in and finding people who are way bigger and stronger than you and trusting that God is going to be faithful to his promise. Not like you have a work meeting today and you have a presentation. I know it's stressful, but... Be not worried and be not dismayed, you know. So just context is important for these. But here the command that's given to all of Israel is going to be the command that's given to just Joshua in Joshua chapter 1. Then all of you came near me and said, let us send men before us that they may explore the land for us and bring us word again of the way by which we must go up into the cities in which we shall come. So this is a little detail that we didn't get in Numbers. In Numbers chapter 13, God tells Moses, send spies into the land. But it turns out that the desire to send spies into the land was actually instigated first by the people. The people were hesitant. They're like, well, let's just be, let's just be aware of what we're going up against. So they wanted to send spies. Then God tells Moses, send spies. So they send spies. And the spies come back and they're like, there is just not a chance that we're going to be able to do this. They're really, really big. They're really tall. Caleb and Joshua, though, they don't say, no, it's actually normal humans there and we're way bigger and stronger. He says, they say, well, God will give it to us because God has said that he will. So let's just go for it. Let's go for it. And that's why they get to go into the promised land with this generation. So then he begins to recount the the wilderness rebellions. And and look at verse 28. He, He begins to say, our brothers have made our hearts melt. That expression, our hearts melt. That's what happened with the Egyptians and with Pharaoh. And then I believe with uh, the the Midianites in numbers, the people's hearts begin to melt seeing the size of, of the Israelites, how numerous they are. But now the Israelites, their hearts are melting because they see the size of the people in the land. They say the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. And besides, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. Who who are the Anakim? Yeah, we heard about them in Numbers chapter 13, 14, the first wilderness rebellion narrative, the big one. Uh, And they said that the, the, the sons of Anak live in the land. And then there's a little, like, it's like a footnote. And it says, the, the Anak are descendants of the Nephilim. You're like, well, who are the Nephilim? Well, you remember that story of Genesis chapter 6. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going we're to start weaving all these things together. But also there's this expression, the cities are great and fortified up to heaven. 
Yeah, the Tower of Babel, all the way back in Genesis chapter 11, Genesis 11, 4. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So in Genesis chapter 11, the, the Tower of Babel, the construction of that was people coming together and they said, let's build ourselves a city and a tower that reaches up into the heavens. And, and now the way that the people of Israel are describing the people in the land is, you know, their cities are great and fortified up to heaven. They're describing the cities as if it is the Tower of Babel itself. This is Babylon that they're about to go up against. And also the Anakim live there. And we're going to trace that thread. And that connects to Genesis chapter 6. So Genesis 6, Genesis 11 seem to be having some sort of play here with the land, the people who inhabit the land. Before we start doing that, I want to give you an illustration of this. So, um, is that how you spell tapestry? Yeah. All right. Tapestries. Beautiful designs. Beautiful pictures. Look at this one. Can I make this big? That's pretty cool. It's amazing. Have you ever seen the back of a tapestry, though? It looks so weird. Um, it's so messy. Yeah, look at that. Uh, so here's the, the back of a tapestry. You could probably imagine what the picture is if you turn it around. Like Maybe it's like a forest, and this is probably like the sky and the clouds. Maybe there's a big tree in the front and a grassy plain. But if you look at the back of a tapestry, it's a complete mess with cords that are attaching to different areas of the picture, of the tapestry. But if you were to pull on that one thread, it pulls all those sections of the picture together. And you can look at it together. And the Bible is a lot like a tapestry where as we're reading through it from Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy, what we're seeing is the front of the tapestry. But at times as readers, we can turn it around and we can actually see where these threads are connecting at different points. And when we pull on them, we can see how they are fitting together. Here's, here's one other illustration, perhaps, to, to think of this. Let's do... This is really obscure. I'm, I'm just thinking of things off the top of my head. Uh, Wikipedia. The best thing ever for a college student. So, World, World, World War II, or the Second World War, or often abbreviated as WWII or WW2, was a world war. Huh. If I click on World War, it takes me to this page. The etymology. The Oxford Dictionary cited the first known usage in the English language to a Scottish newspaper. Ooh, Scottish. I click that. Now I'm on a page for, for Scotland. Scotland, or Scots, Scotland, Scottish, Gaelic, Alba is a country that is part of the United Kingdom. Huh, United Kingdom. And I can just keep clicking these hyperlinks and they're taking me to different pages. So what we were just doing is we were reading through Deuteronomy and I was like, when did we hear that phrase before? What I'm getting you to do is I'm getting you to click on a hyperlink. And then you're like, that's from Genesis chapter one. That's from Genesis 15. Exactly. They're a copy and paste from different sections of the Bible and they're hyperlinks that... For you as a reader, it's supposed to download all that information into your head. If for some reason you just don't know what it means that you are more numerous than the stars of heaven, well, click on that and you go back to Genesis 15 and you read it again and you remind yourself, oh yes, this is about the Abrahamic covenant. It's like going to a Wikipedia page. So hyperlinks exist in the Bible. They're just not blue and it's not digital. You are the one who contains all the information since you've been a good, faithful Bible reader who always has the thumb up every oh, Sunday. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's what we're trying to do. Uh, you guys all already know how to do this because as we've been reading today, I've asked you, where's that from? And you're able to figure out where it's from. That's, doing, that's using a hyperlink in the text or pulling the thread of the back of a tapestry to be able to see the spots it's so we're going to do that with this whole Anakim thing. Because if we keep reading, you can turn to chapter 2. The threads are about to link, and the, the blue letters are about to go off the charts, as it were. 
starting in verse 8. And we turned and went in the direction of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said, Do not harass Moab or contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land for a possession, because I have given our to the, the, to the people of Lot for a possession. So remember, the Moabites are part of the family of Abraham. They're descendants from Lot, who was Lot's brother. It's his nephew. Um, but remember the story, the, the dark night in the cave, the sad and depressing story of human sin. Moabites come from them. That's why they're not, the Israelites aren't allowed to fight against them. So the story uh, in Numbers, chapter 25, 31, uh, 20, and 22 through 24, where where Midian and the Moabites, they hire um, Balaam to curse them. The reason why they only fight against the Midianites in chapter 31 is because God is protecting the family of Abraham. Here. Verse 10. The Amim formerly lived there. This is talking about uh, the, the land of Ar. The Amim formerly lived there, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. Okay. Like the Anakim, they also counted as Rephaim. Oh, okay. But the Moabites called them Amim. So you see what, what's going on there. there. There's these people, there's these things, people, whatever they are, the Rephaim, and one culture, the Moabites call them Amim. Another culture refers to them as Anakim. Another culture refers to them as Rephaim, but it's all the same thing. It'd be like if we, if we got with um, people from multiple nations who spoke different languages and we all looked at a tree and we all called it a tree. Well, it, maybe like our, our Hebrew friends like, oh, an et. But then maybe someone who speaks Spanish says, what is it? Armel. Arbol? Arbol. Okay. Anyone who speaks French know the word for a tree? Arbra. Okay. So we're all saying different things, but we're talking about the same thing, yeah? So some of them call them Amim. Some of them call them Raphaim. Some of them call them Anai, or, or, uh, Anakim. The Horites also lived in Seir formerly, but the people of Esau, dis- who's Esau? Jacob's brother. And Esau gets renamed to Edom. Okay, so the people of Esau, a.k.a. Edom, they dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and settled in their place. So there's also these Horites, whatever these Horite people are, as Israel did in the land of their possession, which the Lord gave them. Hold the phone. You guys catch that? What's going on there? This hasn't happened yet. And who's, who wrote Deuteronomy? Who wrote the Torah? Moses. And what happens at the end of Deuteronomy? Moses dies. He doesn't know this happens. Maybe it's prophecy. It could be. He just like, he, he knows the faithfulness of God. He knows it's going to happen. So he writes it in. Or this is, this is evidence of, um, of scribes keeping the book up to date. So uh, we actually, we'll go to a, another chapter where we see evidence of this. But there are just some things that change over time. And to help you as a reader understand and remember and to know what's going on, sometimes scribes change things. So if, if you were reading a book and it just kept referring to that that place Skinner's mud hole, and you're like, what is Skinner's mud hole? You know, it might be helpful for an editor to come along and put in parentheses, which is now known as Eugene, just so that you as a reader know what's going on. So the scribes kept these books up to date, and it would seem like maybe a scribe or or a prophetic prophetic foreshadowing of Moses that someone in, inserted here. What Esau did to them, the people of Esau did to them, is just like what Israel did to the land that they're about to possess, which the Lord God gave them. Israel drove them out and pushed them out of the land. So now rise up and go over the brook of Zered. So we went over the brook of Zered. And at and the time from our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook was 38 years. So that leaving of Kadesh Barnea, uh, crossing to the brook, um, that's contained in just like two chapters of Numbers. So Numbers is 36 chapters long. It tells about their rebellions, tells about them wandering the wilderness, but only two of them cover this 38-year time frame. So a lot of what happened in the wilderness is not told to us. A lot of it we don't know. We know some of it, but not all of it. 
For indeed, the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the camp until they had perished. Okay, let me open a document just so we can keep track of all these names. Everyone got this? Can I erase this? I'll just leave it. I'll leave it. Okay, so we have in these names, we have the Anakim, we have the Rephaim, the Amim, the Horites? Nope, not the Hotties. <laughs> Uh, those are the names so far, yeah? All right, now we go to chapter three. Oh, no, still in chapter two, sorry. Um, st- starting in verse 18. Today you are to cross the border of Moab to Ar. And when you approach the territory of the people of Ammon, do not harass them or contend with them, for I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the sons of Lot for a possession. Remember, Moab and Ammon are the nations that come from the dark night in the cave with Lot and his daughters. Verse 20, it is also counted as a land of Rephaim. Rephaim formerly lived there, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim. Probably the coolest thing that they're called, Zamzumim. A people great and many, and tall as the Anakim. So notice Rephaim, Anakim are kind of like the baseline terms for them. And then there's all these other ones associated. And they dispossess them. This word dispossess keeps showing up. They dispossess them out of the land. They dispossess them and settled there, settled in their place as he did for the people of Esau who lived in Seir when he destroyed the Horites before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place, even to this day. So what what Esau did, the people of Edom, and what the Moabites did, and what the people of Ammon did with driving out this dispossessing of, of Amim and Horites and Zamzumim is a foreshadowing of what Israel is supposed to do in the book of Joshua that we're going to get instructions for in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Verse 23, as for the Avim who lived in villages as far as Gaza, the Keftorim who came from Kaftor destroyed them and settled in their place. Just another mention of another people who were destroyed by the Kaftorim. Kaftorim um, being um, like coastland people. So just an, it's, it's almost like what's happening is there's the land of Canaan and Below it is the the land of Edom, and then there's the land of Moab, and then there's the land of Ammon, and then on the other side, there's the coastal lands, which end up being possessed by the Philistines. But it's like this, this literary map saying all the surrounding land, the people who inhabit those places, they drove out these Anakim, Rephaim, Amims, the Zamzumim, the Avim. And then what we're going to be told is the Israelites are supposed to do that in their land, the people. So it's linking the people to these people, whatever that means. Just rise up, and go into the valley. Okay, now um, he begins to recount the defeat of the king of Sihon and of Og. And in chapter 3, the defeat of Og, we have this detail that... Uh, that Og, the king of Bashan, he was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. So that story in Numbers where Moses and the people of Israel, they defeat Og and they defeat Sihon, it turns out that they're going up against a giant king, some sort of Rephaim. Og was one of the ones left of the Rephaim. And his bed, really, really big. Nine cubits was its length. A cubit is 18 inches. So a foot and a half, so a foot and a half times nine. And you're like, maybe he just like liked having a really big bed. Maybe, or he was a giant. What's going on with all these things? It continues to get referred to as the land of the Rephaim, the land that they're about to go into, is the land of the Rephaim. The land of the Rephaim. Okay, so now we have to start pulling the thread a little bit, yeah? So we last heard of these 
people in Numbers chapter 11, or Numbers chapter 13 and 14. The end of chapter 13. The spies go in, and when they come out, they, they start telling them about the inhabitants, and they say, well, the descendants of Anak were there. The Anakim. Right, this is Numbers chapter 13. So they go into the land, and their evaluation of the land is that in the land is the Anakim, which in Deuteronomy is called the land of the Rephaim. Uh, again, and, and you know, what did they carry out of the land? Giant grapes. Giant grapes. Who, who would eat a giant grape? It's like, what is going on? The Bible is so weird. <laughs> yeah? This is, okay, let's keep going. We're still in Numbers 13. Uh, here's the report. We saw the descendants of Anak there. Saw the descendants of Anak. Uh, uh, still further down, verses 32 and 33. The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people that we saw in it are great height. They are huge. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak who come from the Nephilim. Okay, so we have to add a name here. So the thread in Deuteronomy that we're starting to pull is taking us back to Numbers 13 and 14, where the people's evaluation of the promised land is that it's filled with Anakim, in Deuteronomy called Rephaim, the land of the Rephaim. And now Anakim is being linked together with Nephilim, their descendants of Nephilim. So now we're going to pull that thread. Where does Nephilim take us? That takes us back to Genesis chapter 6. Oh, the story of the flood. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, spiritual beings, the sons of God saw the daughters of men were good. So they took them as their wives, any that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So we have a few more phrases getting linked in here, and it's a little bit ambiguous about the origin of the Nephilim here in in Genesis chapter 6. No. No. It's calling, it's, it's making an ambiguous connection between the offspring of the sons of God and of the, the daughters of man. So the sons of God are coming and they're taking, so these divine beings are coming and they're taking women and they're having offspring with them, some sort of, of cross boundary offspring. And that's how um, Jude speaks about this. And that's how second Peter speaks about this. Um, they're taking them, and then it says, you know, the Nephilim were in those days, and also afterwards. Afterwards? After the flood. So there's Nephilim before the flood, and there's Nephilim after the flood. And then just by putting that next to it, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So these phrases... Mighty men of old and men of renown is going to be it's expressions that are used about kings in ancient Near Eastern contexts. And the way kings were spoken of and depicted were as being giants. And the reason why they're giants is because they're divine half beings. They're half deity, they're half human, and that's what gives them power and what gives them authority. And if you look up pictures, uh, depictions of kings from the ancient Near East, you can find um, depictions still to this day of, of Assyrian kings and Babylonian kings. And usually they're depicted as like holding a full-grown lion and it looks like a baby kitty in their arms because they're being depicted as a giant. So the mythos in the surrounding culture of the other nations that surround them is that their leaders are these half-divine beings, these half-human 
half divine, and they are giants. That's how they're, they're depicted as. Now, it also seems to be um, some sort of giants, these Nephilim thing. And the whole idea that, that spiritual beings would cross God's designed boundaries and take women and to sleep with them is, is a perverse thought to God. And, and it's one of the reasons why he brings the flood here. It's because of this crossing of boundaries between the Son of God and the sons of men, and because the Lord saw the wickedness of man was really great in the earth. So the flood is not just because the wickedness of man is really great. It is because of that. It's also because the sons of God are taking the daughters of man, sleeping with them. So this cross boundary God does not approve of. So he brings a cleansing flood and he washes through the land. Now the Nephilim, they were in the land before the flood and after. So now in Genesis, we have, let's just think of the story, Genesis chapter 1 through 11, the pattern. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, humanity is placed on a mountain garden. And then Genesis 3, they take from the fruit of the vine, and then they're exiled from the garden, which leads to their son Cain building this city in the east. Yeah? Building a city in the east. Then Genesis chapter 5, you have a um, a genealogy. Then Genesis chapter 6 is the culmination of, of man going to the east and building a city, and it's the story of the flood, where God washes all humanity away. Now we have a reboot where you have the story of Noah and he starts off on a mountain in a garden and then he takes from the fruit of the vine and gets belligerently drunk and then humanity slowly goes to the east and you have Genesis chapter 11 where they're building a city in the east. So God disperses them because remember he said he wouldn't do the flood again so he just spreads them out. So the pattern of Genesis 1 through 11, Genesis chapter 6 and Genesis chapter 11 are parallels to each other as the culmination of human evil and intention. That when human, humanity is left up to their own devices, it culminates in, in corrupt wickedness in the flood, leading up to the flood and then leading up to the dispersion. So... We have in Genesis chapter 1 through 11, the story of the Nephilim is linked to the story of the Tower of Babel. And in Deuteronomy, the the way the people of the land are described are as the Rephaim, the Anakim, which are Nephilim, and as people with fortified cities reaching up to the heavens. So you see how Moses is linking, I mean, Moses writes it all. He's linking into the patterns themselves And he is presenting the people of the land as being not only the Nephilim of Genesis 6, but also the uh, being humanity of Genesis chapter 11. So, what are these? What are they? Are there actually giants? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's massive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just call them Ray Schaefer. <laughs> you ever stand near that guy? Yeah. Yeah. Zam Zumim. And his whole family. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's great. So, They're fine. so are there abnormally large humans in this world? Yes. yes. And uh, throughout the ages, have they been exalted in some way to a status of warrior? Yes. yes. I mean, like... Ray Schaefer was never slaying lions. I mean, he like slaughters pigs and lambs sometimes for his family to eat. But he also was put on a team to fight. It was a basketball team that goes and fights against another people. 
And they, they pick their biggest and strongest warriors to do it. Uh, sports teams? Uh, that, that's just a modern version of, of assembling an army of giants. So the people who you either have fight for you or lead you are, are really big people. Now, are those giants some sort of half-breeds? No. Ray had normal human parents. Both, both his mom and his dad, to my knowledge, were completely human. <laughs> so um, the, the mythos of these people in the ancient Near East is that they were some sort of half-divine, half-human creatures, and that, that was their ploy of why they should be placed as kings over the land. But So think about that claim. To say for yourself, I am part of the divine, so I shall rule over the people. It's a claim of deity. It's a claim to be God and a rejection of him. So God cleanses the earth of that in the flood. He's about to do it again. Now there's one more thread I want to pull on before we go back to Deuteronomy. Found time? Yes. Okay. No time at all. Nice. Okay. Go to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis 14, I think, is a crucial chapter for understanding your Bible, for understanding the hope of the Old Testament, for understanding even Jesus himself and how the New Testament writers view Jesus and speak of him. And it's probably the chapter that we always skip because it sounds like we're reading Lord of the Rings. (laughs) In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, ooh, Shinar? In the land of Shinar, they began to build a tower in the east. The Lord called that place Babel. The land of Shinar is Babylon. So here comes the king of Babylon, uh, along with Arioch, king of Elisar, uh, Chadrolomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, which just means like nations. So he's a, he's a king of the nations. These kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinov, king of Adma, Shemavar, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. And all these journey, joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is the Salt Sea. It's what we call the Dead Sea. They're down by the Dead Sea. For 12 years, they had served uh, Kedal Lamar, but in the 13th year, they rebelled. In the 14th year, Kedal Lamar and the kings who were with him, so the kings of the east, they came, uh, and they, they came and they defeated the Rephaim. So the kings of the east, they come to the land of Canaan by the Dead Sea, and they defeat the Rephaim in Ashtaroth, Karnaim. The Zuzim in Ham. Who might the Zuzim be? The Zamzumim. Yeah? Zuzi, Zuzim. This is just a shortened, abbreviated name. The Zuzim in Ham. The Amim. In Shave Kiriathaim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, which it just so you know, it's not called. Oh, never mind. Oh. So they defeat the Horites in their hill country of Seir as far as El Paran on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazaroth Tamar. So right away, you hear about these kings of the east as being, ki- as being giant conquerors. They come in and they wipe out giants. Are they a threat? Yeah, these guys are tough. They're wiping out the giants of the land with ease. I just want to see what my note is. Yeah, giant. Thanks, Sean. I knew that one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> then... The king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, they went out and they joined battle in the valley of Sidim with Kedor Leomor, king of Elam, Tidal, and Aphromel, and Arioch, the four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits. As the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions that went their way. They also took Lot, son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom in his possessions, and went their way. Uh Uh-oh, it's tense now. So now Abraham, he's got like some skin in the game because his family member has been taken. But these guys are not only kings from the east, the east, but they're giant slayers. 
These guys are threats. So, <clears throat> then someone who had escaped, and they came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eschol, which means uh, giant grapes, yeah, and of Aner. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. As far as Dan? Yeah, Dan doesn't exist yet. Uh, it, this place isn't going to get named as Dan until the end of the book of Joshua. So before that, it was called, it was called um, Laish or Lakish. So it was formerly known as something different, but what is being described is Abram, so Dan is the northernmost part, is the northernmost city in the land of Canaan. And Abram is putting together this small army of 318 men, and he's driving the enemies out of the land as far as Dan. He went in pursuit of them as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to, to Hobab, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsmen lot with his possessions and the women and the people. So in Genesis 14, this coalition of the, ar- the kings from the east, they are giant slayers. Like they're not just giants, they're people who defeat giants and drive them out of the land. But then Abraham, he pursues them as far as Dan to the uttermost part of the land of Canaan and he defeats them and he drives them out. So here is Abraham, Abram, participating in this army, uh, in this war of kings against kings. What would that make Abraham if he's participating? It's really presenting him as a king. And he, by himself, with a small army of 318, is defeating the five great kings of the east. It's presenting Abraham as the king of kings. He is the king of kings who defeats the ones who come into the land, he drives them out of the land. This is exactly what Israel is supposed to do in the book of Joshua. They're supposed to drive out. So Abram is a foreshadow of what Joshua and the people are supposed to do. He did it. And then what follows immediately after that? The blessing of Melchizedek. After his return from the defeat of, we'll just call him uh, CD, the kings... (laughs) who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva. That is the king's valley. He's going to the king's valley to have this victory meal. Abram is being presented as a king. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And then the king of Sodom came out and he said, hey, give me some of the stuff that you just won. And Abraham says, no, I'm not going to do that. The two different kings, the tale of two kings. But Melchizedek comes out and he blesses Abraham. Remember Genesis chapter 12? I will bless those who bless you. Then we're not going to hear about Melchizedek again until Psalm chapter or Psalm 110, where the, the Messiah will be from the order of Melchizedek as a high priest. And then we're not going to hear about Melchizedek again until the book of Hebrews that argues that Jesus' uh, priest, his position as priest is not due to the order of the Levites, because we know he's from the tribe of Judah, but he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So so God's blessing of Melchizedek, because Melchizedek blessed Abraham, is to to present a priestly order after him in his name. But here in the center of Abraham's story, Abraham is a king of kings who drives the people out of the land, defeating not just giants, but the people who defeat the giants. Drives them out of the land, and then there is blessing, and there's peace. Now go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy 
The people have been described as giants who are in the land. Yes, they are giants. What happened last time there were giants in the land and we heard a story about what God did? Nephilim? Flood. That brought them all out. Brought them to destruction. Deuteronomy chapter 7. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and, def- and you defeat them, you must devote them to complete destruction. All right, so I did all that work because usually we just get to hear like, whoa, hold the phone. God's just going to wipe everyone out and kill them. You know, there, there's some work to be done about what the term com- devote them to complete destruction means. But even so, if it, if it just means wipe them all out, what does that mean? Well, as we've been pulling on the threads, it's not just like a local village. At least they're not presented as just a local village. They're presented as the Nephilim, Rephaim, Anakim, who all throughout the Bible have been these, these crossing of boundaries, of sexual boundaries that God has established. And we have Leviticus chapter 18 and chapter 20 that outlines the, the sexual deviations of the people where there's lots of incest taking place, seizing of other people for sexual desires, and these crossing of boundaries um, they have done horrendous things, and God's removal of them is, is an act of a flood. So the people of Israel are, are the flood in the story of Joshua. It's not water now, it's people. Uh, when the Lord gives them over to you and you defeat them, you must devote them to complete destruction. So destruction. And then it says, you shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them or giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. So is Israel just spared from how they behave? Can they just behave however they want? No. If they reject God, they also face the same destruction. But here you have first said, devote them to complete destruction. Then you have said, don't marry them and don't make covenants with them. Maybe that's the case. Maybe God just knows that they're not going to destroy them all. Maybe somehow in our definition of what it means to to devote them to complete destruction, it's just the word for ban, ban them. Somehow that also includes them being around or existing, but... You can't intermarry with them, and you can't make covenants with them. Go now to chapter 9. Yeah. 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 One of my emails, I put together a few pieces from Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy about what this term means, but we can look at that at the end. But I think this is going to give more light to this whole idea. Hear, Shema, or listen, or obey. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today to go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Dispossess. That's the same thing that... Um, the Edomites did, same thing that the Moabites did, it's the same thing that the people of Ammon did, the same thing that, uh, I can't remember how it's phrased, but the, the coast, coastal people, this is what they did. They, they drove out those giants. You are to go in and to dispossess nations greater and mightier than you, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and a people tall, the sons of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? So the dispossession of the land is a driving out of giants. That means 
Know therefore today that he who goes over before you as a consuming fire is the Lord your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you. So you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly as the Lord has promised you. Drive them out, make them perish. Are these, are these logical steps? Like first drive them out, then slaughter them? Or are these um, synonymous expressions? Are, the technical term would be oppositional. Is it that driving them out is making them perish? To drive them out is for them to perish. To be out of the land is to perish. Or is it drive them out of the land and then kill them? No. Because, remember, you, spilling blood in the land uh, pollutes it. So there's two options. Both are valid options, understanding that. But notice that it's God doing this. Here God says, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to subdue them before you. I'm going to drive them out. But he also told Israel to do that, which is Verse 4, do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you. Push them out. After God has pushed them out before you. Ah, it's because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Key verse. Key verse. The Canaanite conquest is not based off of ethnicity at all. People throughout history have, have misused the Bible to make excuses for, for a, a war against ethnic people groups. And it's just never been the case. It has always been a war against evil, not against ethnicity. God is driving them out because of the wickedness of these nations. The Lord is driving them out before you. The instrument to drive them out, rather than water, like Genesis chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, this time is going to be a flood of people driving through the land. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you. And that he may confirm the word the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So there's a, a two-piece reason why God is driving these people out of the land. One, it's actually just an act of judgment, an act of justice against their evil and their wickedness. Drive them out. And God's not rewarding Israel. He's not rewarding them. Are, are they faithful and righteous and upright people? No, we just heard about 40 years of them not being that. God is giving them this land because he made a promise in the covenant to Abraham. So God's being faithful to his word, and he's also being just against evil. That's why they're going into the land to have it. That is why. And in fact, here's what he says about the people. Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness. Because you're really stubborn. You are really stubborn people. Remember and do not forget how you provoke the Lord, your God in wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came here, you are rebellious against the Lord. Even at Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath and the Lord was angry with you and he was ready to destroy you. That's when I went up to get the tablets of stone on the mountain. I was there for 40 days, 40 nights. The Lord gave me the tablets and I came down and I saw what you were doing. So I threw them down and broke them. But then I went up and I interceded and he just goes on and on and on recounting about the failure of Israel. The point being that if Israel acts in the same wicked and corrupt way, they will be expelled from the land. And what happens in the Bible? They get expelled from the land. And the way the prophet Ezekiel speaks and depicts exile is as a valley of dry bones. It's as death. All right? Because what happens if you're, oh, if you're unclean and you have to leave the presence of the tabernacle? It's like experiencing Death. Exiled from the land, death. Ban them. Complete, devote them to complete destruction. Okay. We didn't get nearly as far as I thought we would. <laughs> but questions. Questions on this. Because this is heavy stuff. Yeah, Mike. Quick question. Once again, blood. Mm -hmm. Only blood. 
Yes. Need a reference? Yeah, so the, the question is, in the flood narrative, only Noah's family survived, so how are their Nephilim afterwards, basically? Um, so I think that's a really helpful um, thing to notice because the the – the mythos is that Nephilim are created by the sons of God sleeping with the daughters of man. If that were the case, there would not be Nephilim anymore. But Nephilim are just big humans. Big humans, strong humans, who then get either exalted by people or they exalt themselves. So to say that there was Nephilim before, there was Nephilim after, it's just like, it's like, yeah, just humans. Or the other case is that after the flood in Genesis chapter, uh, end of chapter 8, um, God makes the covenant with Noah. He says, you know what? I'm never again going to curse the ground because of man because the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. The flood did not resolve anything about the human condition. Humanity is still sinful. So it's as if the Nephilim are results of man's wickedness and corruption. That is, wickedness grows in humanity and, and begins to, to flourish and multiply. Well, so do the Nephilim seem to sprout up and take power. That'd be a way of it too. But yeah, it's one of those little mysteries. How are they there before and after if there's only one boat? Great swimmers? A any other? Yeah, maybe they were just so tall they could just stand the entire time. Yeah. Yes, could be that. Yeah. Any other questions on what we've talked about in Deuteronomy? Yeah. 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 Yeah, he does blame them. But as we read numbers, doesn't it seem like it's because he struck that rock? Boom, boom. Well, did he strike the rock because they were sinning in that moment? Or is he referring to their sin of rejecting the land in Numbers chapter 13, 14? And he's a part of that generation. There was never something to make us think that he was going to be excluded from that. Yeah. 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 Moses. <laughs> Human. Okay. Deuteronomy. Uh, we're going to finish it next week. We'll look at some of the case laws and some of the core themes of love and listen. And we'll look at how the, the book concludes. My, my encouragement for you, not just in reading Deuteronomy, but reading the whole thing is to think about how do the people of God relate to God and how can they even be in this relationship in the first place. The, the core of, do, of the Torah so far has been putting in front of us the importance of covenant and the importance of atonement. Thinking about those two things are very important. They're, the people of Israel aren't going in saying like, well, if we do all these things, then we'll be in a relationship with God. It's the, it's the reverse order of those things. So, Listen and love, pay attention to those things, and then think about covenant and atonement. Let me pray for us. Let's go worship. Father, we are, are thankful for this morning, and we're thankful that your word uh, makes us feel unsettled at times because it's a reminder that, that you set the agenda and that you are trying to teach us and show us things about yourself and about your world that you have created. And God, we, we don't want to live according to our own eyes or our own hearts. We want to follow you. So, so God, even as we explore and ponder this, this seemingly mystery about giants in the Bible, God, we want to see how these threads connect, that what Israel was supposed to do, God, Abraham did do. And as a, a king of kings driving out the, the giants and the, the kings from the land, God, you, you, you show us a small picture of, of cleansing and of conquering kings. And even as we've, we've discussed together, there are there are giants like Goliath later on, and, and we see a king of kings, David, defeating Goliath. And God, it, it, it all builds the anticipation where we know that there is a conquering king in Christ who, who brings cleansing, who brings forgiveness, who brings atonement, and who conquers the, the giants and the, the perverse things of this world. But he doesn't do so by destroying them. He does so by letting it destroy him. So God, remind us that this morning as we spend time in worship and unity and fellowship. And we love you and we need you to pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. One more week in the Torah.